if you're just joining us, we're just waiting to make sure that everyone gets here who's watching live and that YouTube is recording this. Well, hello, I'm Catherine Jean Lopez from the National Review Institute. And um, this is part of a series called Making Sense of uh, 2020. And um, I'm here with Naomi Schaefer Riley from the American Enterprise Institute and Malka Groden from the Manhattan Institute. Um, Malka is um, a, an adoptive parent. And today we're gonna talk about adoption and foster care and, um, and some of the uh, child welfare issues that frankly don't get enough attention. Um, Naomi just wrote a piece about kinship care in New Jersey. And it's a really scandalous, scandalous uh, reality that she's um, brought to light. And so Naomi, do you wanna start us uh, on, the, on that? Sure. Thanks for having me, Catherine. Um, so this, uh, about a month ago, I got a call from a couple of people in New Jersey with some very strange news they had to report, which was that New Jersey was no longer recruiting foster parents. Um, and I thought this was really strange because across the country, as you and I and Malka have talked about, there is a shortage of foster parents in most states um, and they're doing anything they can to try to recruit qualified people to take in kids at risk. So, oh, New Jersey just doesn't need them anymore. There was a note on their website saying due to COVID, they had decided to reevaluate things and great news. Um, it turns out that they had enough kids in kinship care, that is the, who had been placed with their extended family, um, that they no longer needed any non-relative foster parents. The one exception was if you were willing to take in a, a child who had um, severe medical needs, uh, then they might be willing to talk to you. But otherwise, everything's fine and dandy. They don't need anyone at all. Um, so I started making some phone calls. Uh, a lot of people I talked to in the child welfare world had no idea that this was going on and were frankly quite shocked and many of them dismayed to find out that this was the case. Um, and we're kind of wondering exactly what was going on. Um, so I dug into the numbers a little bit to try to figure out what was going on uh, in New Jersey. Um, what I found was that uh, these, peop these kids were not being placed in official kinship care for the most part. Um, it's about less than half of kids in New Jersey who are currently in foster care who are living with an extended family. Um, but that left probably about maybe 2000 kids from what I could tell who were kind of, um, unaccounted for, like, well, may, maybe more than that. If you look at the kind of trends in New Jersey over the last several years, um, their numbers of kids in foster care have completely plummeted. Um, uh, just in the last few years alone, since 2014, I think they've gone down by 50%. So there are a lot of ways um, to make the numbers turn out the way you want in the child welfare system. Um, one is, uh, you know, how much child abuse and neglect you find. Um, and it turns out New Jersey is claiming that they have about half the rate of child maltreatment that the rest of the country has, which particularly given um, how much New Jersey has suffered from the opioid crisis would be very surprising statistic. So it's, it's clear, I think, that what is happening there, and I go into this extensively in the piece, is that state child welfare workers are being told um, to find relatives for kids to stay with if their situation at home is deemed unsafe. The problem with this kind of informal care is that the state does not keep track of how many kids are in that situation. Um, and the state does not follow up with these kids afterwards. So you sort of have this black box that a lot of kids are going into because they say, oh, well, good news, you know, they can stay with aunt so-and-so or the grandmother or someone else. Um, and then we don't have to be responsible for them anymore. But I think that's just not true. No. First of all, this is this is unbelievable that they would need more foster parents because COVID has made the situation worse. We don't even know how many kids um, need help because because um, there's not the same kind of ability to go into homes, right? Um, and and um, so ideally, you do want kids with their family, right? <laughs> and and so, but what is the problem with this sort of ideological kinship care that, that's going on. 
So I think, you know, everyone can agree, no matter where you are on the, the political spectrum or what you believe about social issues, that it's great for kids if they can't be with their parents to be able to be with their grandparents or their aunts or uncles or, you know, people that they know really well and are familiar with to avoid the trauma of just placing them with strangers. That certainly makes sense. The problem is that a lot of the pathologies that are occurring that cause them to be removed from their home in the first place are actually affecting other members of their family too. Um, and also when they're placed with those other members of the family, they often have continued contact with the members of their family who are the problem in the first place. Um, and I cite in the piece, um, uh, the, uh, the, the movie about J.D. Vance, uh, The Hillbilly Elegy, which was a, a book first, of course. Um, J.D. Vance was, was quite lucky in the sense that when his mother uh, had a severe addiction problem, um, his grandmother sort of swooped in to take care of him. This was um, sort of portrayed as informal kinship care, that the state was not checking up on him, even though um, there had been reports to child welfare of what, what had gone on, one called in by J.D. Vance himself. Um, and so he was taking care of his grandmother, who was, you know, turned out to be this very, like, you know, hard driving woman who wanted him to get an education, all these other things. Um, that I think is more the exception than the rule. And he was obviously very lucky to have someone in his life like this who could do this. Um, but I think one question is, uh, you know, he was able to make that determination, you know, at, you know, the age of 10 or 12, that he'd rather be staying with the grandmother, and that she turned out to be this great influence on his life. In a lot of cases, I think kids would make that decision, but they might not end up staying with a relative who would be a good influence on their lives. And how much can we trust those relatives without any kind of follow-up? I mean, I also talk in the piece about how we have much lower standards for when kids stay with relatives. Uh, routinely, relatives do not have to pass the same kind of criminal background checks uh, that foster that non-relative foster parents have to, have to pass. And even in cases where it's actually formal, a lot of times caseworkers just don't feel the same kind of obligation to check up on kids who are with family that they do to check up on kids in non-relative foster care because they feel like, well, you know, it's the family's responsibility. So what are you hoping comes of this coming to light in New Jersey? Well, I think the people in New Jersey deserve some kind of transparency about this. I mean, what what is happening to these kids? Um, I, I There was no general announcement so far as I know that New Jersey is not recruiting foster parents anymore. I mean, frankly, if it were the good news that the state was claiming it is, this should be on the front page of every paper in New Jersey. Like, great, right. you know, we have solved our child welfare problem and every state should be doing what we're doing. But right. I think um, the fact that it, it has sort of gone unnoticed um, suggests that the state is engaging in some practices that, that people there know are pretty dicey. What what is a scenario where people are get up in arms? Who are the people who would get up in arms about this? It's hard to say. Um, I mean, I think that there are definitely foster parents who are concerned about this. Um, you know, I but talked as you've to, written about before, people frequently don't care about foster. They parents. don't care about them. Yes, um, I think that there are uh, leaders of religious organizations that do foster care and adoption that are concerned about this. Um, but it's, it's hard to sort of work up the kind of um, public outcry that you need. Um, and, and frankly, the only areas of child welfare that ever get any kind of public outcry these days are, you know, there are racial disparities in foster care or, you know, other aspects of the system that are sort of more trendy to talk about right now. Right, right. But how about we just care for these kids, right? Um, Malka, um, with the topic of racial disparities, I, I think of you and, and want you to unmute yourself. Um, what, your blood must boil as you, you hear this, this story from Naomi. Yeah. I mean, New Jersey. Yeah. I mean, when I hear Naomi talk about it, I, I mean, I've seen just firsthand through just the way that pathology it can't be that, you know, someone grew up in a certain home. And then we're expecting, and then certain things happened and they have certain challenges in their life. And then we're expecting those very people or those very relatives to, to now take the child in when those same pathologies um, are present. So it's just, um, it's, it's like, it's just replicating, replicating that cycle um, for that child um, and not giving them a chance out. Um, and then in terms of, I mean, the racial disparities, yeah, are, we were just talking about it. it just right now, we, given given this moment that we're in, where it seems like um, 
everything needs to be looked through, um, everything's looked at through the lens of, of, of race. I mean, we kind of saw this coming, but it's still, it, it's coming faster and harder. I just didn't expect it to happen this quickly um, because what it, what it really, um, it's, it's, it's like all those questions about um, the nuclear family, all of those are being brought to light and being unpacked very quickly. Um, when in the past, it was, it was almost as if you were able to, um, this, this, was, this um, was underneath the conversations about adoption and foster care, but it wasn't driving in, it wasn't so transparent and obvious. Like this situation in New Jersey is so um, obviously about, um, confront the kind of the, the sentiment that being in a whole family is better for a child, it's safer for a child. And this says, no, that's, that's not the case. And saying that in some way is, is racist. Um, so I think that we're seeing that right now. Malka, for um, anybody who's watching this who hasn't heard your story before, can you talk about, about some of your firsthand experience with this and how you came to adopt and why you are an activist now. Sure. So uh, my husband and I come from the, uh, the Hasidic community in Crown Heights. We came to adoption really because we wanted to build our family. We had struggled with infertility and I did not plan on, um, I just didn't expect my journey into adoption to be the way it was. I really thought that it was like, I want children. We need, we, I want to have a family. And then very quickly, I was just thrust into this alternate reality, um, which Naomi writes about all the time. But I grew up in a middle-class home, um, loving parents, and suddenly I'm surrounded by, you know, conversations where um, family members are incarcerated, uh, drug addiction is rampant, um, and incarceration is just a part of life. Um, there's, you know, fatherlessness. Um, and... So that really made me shift um, my thinking about this whole issue. Um, and, and as part of this process, I think, you know, what we were referring to before about race really um, was this underlying focus in my journey toward adoption and like all the um, trainings I had to do, but it wasn't as blatant as it is right now. And that happened so quickly. Um, meaning before it was, you know, as an adoptive parent, as a, you, you want to, um, they, they warn you, don't, you know, you, you don't want to fall into the trap of becoming the white savior, um, perpetuating the cycle of the white savior, but it still didn't feel as blatant as it is right now. Because again, now it's part of this larger, um, larger movement. Um, and so the nuclear family is really under attack in a way that it wasn't before. Um, so I recently did an event um, where I spoke for prospective adoptive parents about, um, you know, what it's like to raise children of another race and the challenges. And there are challenges and there are things that are different. Um, it, but the whole session was about how um, white parents or prospective parents um, need to accept their white privilege. They need to unpack their backpack of privilege. They need to go on a privilege walk. And I'm sitting there and, and then at the end I'm supposed to say, hey, you should do this. You should open your homes and do something different and, and push yourself. And it's, there's one thing to acknowledge difference, to embrace difference, to, um, to not be blind to challenges. And there's another to blow up this challenge as so primary that basic things like child safe, a child safety and security is non-existent. Um, and that's, I think that's what we're seeing so quickly already in New Jersey. Um, and that's why you, that's why you have this abolish foster care movement. It's a whole like, let's throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, no pun intended, but this whole idea that this is a system that is so broken because of racial disparities, that it's better for us to leave kids in situations that are dangerous than to make them a part of this racist system. I mean, I think that is ultimately the message of um, abolish foster care. I mean, I, I mentioned that, you know, New Jersey has been under a consent decree and the person who is in charge of that consent decree is part of the upend movement, 
which seeks to eventually abolish foster care. And so, you know, how can you, you know, oversee a system that you think fundamentally shouldn't exist? And it's also why do why do the children have to be like the sacrifice at the altar of the movement? It's like the most vulnerable people need to take the fault for all, take the, you know, the bullet for all of us. It's it's so that we can feel good as white people. I, I, meaning it's like this whole, you know, convoluted thing that just harms children. Well, Malka, you, you mentioned the nuclear family. This this drives me crazy too in the context of of questions about religious liberty and that there's this Supreme Court case about Philadelphia um, that was heard in November. And when there are children who need help, adults are not going to work out all of their differences on same-sex marriage and all of these things. How about we have more choices rather than less and have oversight and, and let's help these kids who don't have time, right? Um, but, but Naomi, I mean, is this abolished foster care? I mean, this is a real thing because it doesn't get the same press time as abolish the police. It, it doesn't because it's a smaller movement. Um, but I think you, you absolutely see it um, in, the, in the world of child welfare leaders. You see it in the world of academia. Um, you see it in journalism now over and over again. Um, you, there, there, there were protests over the summer that included abolish foster care as part of their message. So yes, it, it, it is absolutely a thing. And I, I think that it is like abolish the police in the sense that I don't think anyone is actually abolishing the police anytime soon. What effect this will have though is very similar. It's going to deplete resources from the foster care system. Um, it's going to make people more distrustful of the system. Um, it's going to make people who aren't wanna be foster and adoptive parents think twice about whether to get involved. So all these states that are talking about foster parent shortages, I mean, basically the more of a shortage you have the lower the quality, and I and I don't, you know, use that. I'm not using that word lightly. I'm talking about, you know, who can be a stable, positive influence on a child's life. Those are the people that we want to be volunteering to be foster parents. If you constantly beat them over the head with the message that foster care is evil, it's racist, and you don't want to have anything to do with the system, the people who will be left in the foster care system, the parents who will volunteer to do this are not the people you want. Mm -hmm. And I think you you often hear this about what's going on with the police force. You, you're seeing a huge exodus of quality police officers who don't wanna be treated by politicians and, and other leaders like crap. Um, and they're, they're gonna go, either they're gonna quit, they're gonna retire, they're gonna go to places where people appreciate them more. Um, and But the people who are going to fill those roles because frankly, you're still gonna have a police force are gonna be people who don't have another choice. People who just like carrying a gun around. Like, I mean, this is the, 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 the fundamental understanding of incentives in these public systems I think is completely missing. And is there a danger too that libertarians, conservatives find this, this movement tempting? Because we don't like government. We don't trust. Well, <laughs> there's absolutely that temptation. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, a, a variety of libertarian groups have jumped on the foster care is racist bandwagon, just like they've, you know, gone with the, you know, mass incarceration is the biggest problem and it's all systemic racism that's at the heart of it. Um, I think that, you know, I totally understand the view that you don't want government interfering in your family. I mean, that that is completely legitimate. And we've seen plenty of cases throughout history where that interference has proved harmful. The problem is that we have to balance the interests of society's most vulnerable people, these kids who are at risk and in danger with our interests in liberty as parents. And I'm not saying it's an easy balance to strike, but this sort of flip way of just saying, well, we should just abolish foster care because it's racist. I just, I, I would hope that my libertarian friends would kind of rise to the occasion and understand that there's something more complex going on here. And Malcolm, you mentioned growing up in a middle-class family. Isn't this like a flip middle-class thing to say to you? I mean, there are these extreme circumstances that children find themselves in that are kind of off the radar until, you know, something terrible happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, we're talking about um, situations where, I mean, children don't have the very basic, the very basic 
um, needs that you need uh, to grow up in a safe and secure home. We're not talking about, you know, no one demands that adoptive or foster parents be some kind of extra human, um, superhuman, which I think is kind of the, the reputation that they get. Right. It's talking about, you know, Melissa Buck, who, who you um, introduced me to, um, a, a, a foster and adoptive mom. I mean, she always talks about, I mean, it's really, it's, it's just being there and being good enough. Um, so, but even that, even saying that, um, even saying that there are certain kind of those basic um, qualities that we're saying are good to have in a home that, that to provide the foundation that a child needs, th those ideas are under attack. So it is, it is that very kind of um, problem that is now seen uh, as the middle class home. Um, but, but yes, we're saying that, those, that children find themselves in situations where they don't have those very basic things like a bedtime, um, like knowing who's coming in and out of the house, um, which is again, the problem that we see in kinship care is when those very same pathologies are, are, are happening in, in another home, where again, you don't know who's coming in the house, you don't know what, what, the, what the drug use is in the home. Um, so it kind of, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem that that child needs taken care of. And, and just to touch on what Naomi said about incentive, incentive um, and kind of how we saw a drop off in you know, uh, recruitment of police officers. I mean, incentive is really important. No, nobody need, foster and adoptive parents, I don't think need to be flattered or, or said, you know, you're, you're a saint. But there is something nice to being recognized as like, guess what, you're doing a good job and society values you and really needs you. And when it's the opposite, I, I wouldn't discount it. I mean, this summer, I got so many calls from people like, what do you think about George Floyd? What do you and it's, I don't, we don't have to get into the details of that. But it's like, I'm a mother caring for children. I don't need to get into like the broader political implications of my adoption story. Um, and it feels like every adoptive and foster parent is now asked to do that. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, the, the, the incentive structure, I mean, the, nobody wants to say, well, um, you know, it's, it would be great to have middle-class families, you know, take in children who are at risk. But I think we need to be able to say that, not mm -hmm. because middle class families are able to give their kids better clothes and more games, um, but because there is a sense of stability there. And what happens sometimes in the foster care system, it's, it's very small amounts of money that we're giving people. And so what you have sometimes is people who are just frankly doing it for the money and who are worried about where the next rent check is gonna come from or how they're gonna afford groceries or things like that. For a child who's already experienced a level of trauma and instability that has pushed them into the foster care system, for, for us then to say, you know, this child needs to stay in that kind of unstable environment because frankly that's all we have open to them i i think is just it's 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 just simply adding to their trauma and and i've we've talked about this before i mean the, it's not just the the money i mean the foster care system is is essentially laid out so that people who are middle class and people who are employed um you know are, are pushed out of it in a lot of ways i mean if 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 you have a regular job and you know you have caseworkers who just say oh, I'm going to drop by tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., you know, for, for a check, whatever. And you're like, well, I, I have a job. I have to be at my job. I mean, they don't care. Or, you know, you should spend tomorrow all day in family court. Um, who knows when the judge will call your case, um, but you'll just have to wait around and maybe it'll be, you know, adjourned to a future time. We, we have no idea. The, the foster care system is um, basically geared toward and set up for people who are, you know, foster parents, that is, um, you know, who are uh, un or underemployed um, and who need the money. And I, I don't think that that's attracting the people that we want in the system, frankly. Naomi, you've written about foster parents and how we can better serve them. Um, what are some of the priorities going into the next year that you'd like to emphasize? So um, 
I really do think that, uh, you know, a lot of the faith-based agencies that we've talked about that are doing such great work, you know, recruiting and supporting foster families, I would love to see them spread more, um, particularly into the Northeast where we don't have as many of those organizations. I'd love to see their numbers replicated. Um, I just did a, a piece for um, City Journal where I, uh, they have a series called uh, N New York City Reborn um, and asked about some of the, um, you know, the priorities for changing child welfare. Um, I'd love to see predictive analytics used to understand which kids are most at risk in our system. Um, I, in, and there are other kinds of data that I think we should be looking at too. Um, there's a program called Family Match, which actually uh, helps uh, caseworkers find adoptive families for kids. And because it is, it works across county lines, um, a lot of times there are more matches made using that system. The, the people who developed eHarmony are actually responsible for the algorithm behind uh, this this program, and I would love to see you know other states and other cities adopt those kind of things because you know frankly our child welfare system I think is you know stuck in the 1980s. Malta, part of your story, which is so important that you touched upon in in talking about your your talking to to prospective uh, foster parents is. I mean, they had you in tears um, because because you were going to adopt biracially. And have you seen anything encouraging? I know you've seen a lot of discouraging things, but anything encouraging about supports for, for foster parents in that regard? I mean, you know, not only do we need foster parents, but we need people around those foster parents to support them so they don't have a nervous breakdown while they're being told they're racist for, for wanting to, uh, to care for a, children, a child in need. Yeah, I mean, I think most of the, that support really comes right now from religious voices, um, which is why, you know, the Philadelphia case was so important, um, is so important. Um, and also so horrific, too, that they were... That right, religious right. But really, those are the only... I mean, those are the voices, really, that are... That, that, that support parents. And I, I mean, I come from the Jewish community. I don't really have very much support. So I look to Catholic and Christian voices on that, um, who, who remind you that, you know, there are things that are more important um, than race or that come above, be, that precede race. Um, but that's really it. And that's really the, the, my fear, you know, when we see um, faith-based agencies under attack, because like, if you lose them, then, even if, if, even if you're, you know, affiliated with a faith and you use a secular agency or a private agency, or, I mean, at least you have them to kind of go back to, but if you lose them, I'm not aware of any other voices that openly make that case. It's a pretty, it's because it's a pretty like scandalous statement to make in today's world um, that r race isn't that first determining factor in terms of like how you match children and, um, so I wish I could be more encouraging in my answer. This is a terrible, sad answer, but it's true. No, I, I'd recommend we um, we just AEI just put out a paper um, about transracial adoption, which I'd really recommend to everyone. Um, it actually looks at the data um, and out outcomes for kids and finds virtually no differences between same race and transracial adoption in terms of the outcomes for kids. And it's just a message that is not out there enough. Um, these are the two people who wrote it are um, liberal academics um, and they have themselves uh, adopted um, both out of foster care domestically and also internationally from Africa. And they really want to know what the research said. And so I would just commend that, that paper to everyone because I think that there's just, there's a lot of rhetoric about this and not a lot of um, information out there. Um, but I also wanted to, to, you know, just to mention that a lot of these faith-based organizations, they're not just supporting foster parents and foster children, they're also supporting the caseworkers and child welfare agencies. Mm -hmm. One of the um, women who contacted me from New Jersey um, runs a program called Miriam's Heart. 
And she was actually trying to get New Jersey to adopt a care portal, um, which is a, a, a huge program. I think it's, and I, last time I looked, it was like in 20 states or so, um, where uh, foster parents uh, and caseworkers can post if they have uh, needs like, you know, car seats or cribs or bunk beds or, you know, a variety of things that right now caseworkers are responsible for finding for families. Like, you, you, you know, on, on top of everything else a caseworker has to do, she also has to, you know, go to Walmart and buy a bunch of baby clothes, which is ridiculous because, you know, in these communities, it's very easy to find those things. So Care Portal is kind of a, a website that matches people's needs, uh, you know, with what people already have, strollers and, and other things. And they also, you know, have people who are volunteering their services in various ways. If you need, you know, your sink fixed or something like that, what something that's preventing you from being reunited with your children even. Um, so I think that there, these organizations are serving the whole system and biological families, foster parents, foster kids, and I think really trying to be as helpful as possible to people who are working in the system. One of the reasons I want to have with this conversation, you know, as we're nearing the end of the year is because, because of coronavirus, I think a lot of people have, have, uh, you know, buckled down, they've had to, right? We had, we had shutdowns and things. And so like being welcoming is against the culture right now, you know? Um, but at the same time, I, I think, you know, the, the fear of death that people are experiencing and all these things really are um, a rallying cry to realize we don't have a lot of time here on earth and, you know, and there are people who need our help. And, um, and things like Care Portal give me such encouragement, Naomi, because we're not even in saying everybody needs to adopt, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's only one adopted mob in this conversation here, but we all have a role um, and we ha all have ways that we can, we can help. And some of those groups that, um, that you highlight, Naomi, are just, and, and as you were just talking about Malka, some of these faith-based faith -based groups just kind of make all the difference and are the best of civil society and exactly what we want to encourage and know about. And, but like, hardly anybody knows about them, <laughs> you know? And, and Naomi, you do all this incredible work. They am so excited that AEI supports, but sometimes it's hard to get anyone's attention because you know, presidency, you know, only thing we care about or whatever, whatever the latest terrific, you know, crime or um, whatever it is we're all paying attention to. But meanwhile, there, as Malcolm was saying, there are people just living their lives. That's the majority of America. And we don't have to weigh on, in on everything. We can just help one another, you know? Yeah, I think a lot of these organizations have gotten very creative during the lockdown. I mean, they're having like, you know, car parades, instead of having like a clothing drive where everybody drops stuff off, like they're basically like having car parades through the streets where everybody kind of brings out their stuff and, you know, dumps it into a trunk in like a no contact way. Um, I, I think, and, and frankly, I think there are people who have who have stepped up and, and thought about foster care in ways that they haven't before, just because they're home. Maybe they, you know, don't have to travel as much. Maybe like there, there are options now available for them that weren't before. Um, you know, obviously I think that other people have had to, you know, back off and say like, I, you know, their the health risks are too great, um, uh, you know, because of themselves or maybe because of other children in the home too, who may have, um, you know, uh, compromised health problems. So, so I think that, you know, you're, you're kind of seeing this move both ways. Um, you know, for some people, COVID has, you know, has forced them, you know, to, to take a less active role. And for some people, it's forced them to take a more active role. Um, but, you know, we, we are, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And I, and I, you know, I do hope that, um, you know, by the time we get there, you know, we, we won't have, it, we, we have to kind of keep paying attention to these ridiculous abolish foster care conversations because by the time we get to the end of the lockdowns and everything, like what is the system gonna look like? And will these activists have done so much damage that it will really deter good people from going into this work? And it's not it's, just d deter, but there's a real climate of fear that comes with this racial rhetoric, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a climate of if you make one misstep, you're done. And so, and, and 
there's something about entering this world where it feels like you're making a value statement. <laughs> like, and maybe you are, you're making a value statement that safe, secure homes are important and you feel like you have the capacity to provide that, but it does feel like it's more loaded given the moment. Um, so, but I do think similar to what Naomi was saying that in some way, COVID has for a lot, a lot of people reminded them of, oh, um, like what, what, you know, it sounds very kitschy, but what's really important. Um, and, if, if, and a lot of people are thinking in the kind of, I'm home, I'm with my family. And, I, and there is an opening there to kind of make the case for opening your home, um, you know, just I guess this whole feeling of especially people who are working from home and your whole day bleeds into one and your children are there, it just kind of makes you rethink priorities a little bit. Um, so maybe there's an opening there. I have been struck by the number of parents who've told me that they realize I don't want to travel again. <laughs> like if, if I don't have to be on the road every week, that's good. It's good for my family. It's good for my health, you know? Yeah. Or even little things like I drop off my children at school. Thankfully they have school. Um, and, and those little things that I didn't do before, I realized, wow, this is 20 minutes of my day that is so crucial for the child. Um, so I think a lot of people, I think a lot of working women, um, working mothers, I'm sure are seeing that. And Malka, that point you made before about uh, adoptive parents aren't superheroes, I think is so important. Of course, you mentioned Melissa Buck. When Melissa Buck talks about this, she kind of does She might be a superhero. She, she Sorry. is a superhero. She's the exception. <laughs> I hope she sees this. She's my hero. I love well, I, I did an event with her a couple of weeks ago, and she's talking about the, the sibling group that she's keeping together and so that she's adopting another ch child. I mean, th they are an amazing family. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, in truth, she's just, she's doing what a Christian is called to do. She's doing what a person of faith is called to do. You, you know, you're created by a creator, you know, and given gifts. And, and because we've lost that sense in our culture, I, I think this makes it even harder for people to comprehend why we shouldn't just be, you know, arguing about what everybody else is arguing about and actually do something, you know, make a real charitable contribution to society. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I recently saw, um, so there's this country singer, Thomas Rhett, who has an adopted, who has adopted children, yeah. an adopted daughter. And I, whenever I see that, his, um, whatever it's called, feed, I'm just struck by how powerful it is for all all of those people that are watching him and look up to him. And I, I don't know, I, I, and we've lost those kind of um, like cultural, those celebrities that, that there is an effect to seeing them do something because so many of them, I mean, Naomi, didn't you just write about this about John Legend saying that like, I'm not going to give charity. Like that's not the. Well, he said he would still give to charity. He just thought it was more important for you to give to the Georgia special election. Right. Um, so, and so there is something there that it's like you lose something when John Legend's followers read that it has an effect on them. And so and then the opposite really is powerful, too. And, you know, having, you know, more um, like visible adoptive foster families who is powerful. So. Because I have to get in touch with my celebrity friends. <laughs> yes, yes, Malco. Could you get on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I mean you're you're right, Catherine. Like it's very, it's very hard to get attention to this issue. And just to to go back to something you were saying before, like I I do think that, you know, when you hear this rhetoric about abolishing foster care and and you really don't understand like, you know, how desperate the situations of some of these kids are, I, I think that that's the form of privilege that we should be talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I did a piece um, that's, uh, I think gonna hopefully be in national affairs soon, which is about um, the, the, uh, the kind of free range parent movement and the intersection between that and the debate over child welfare. And I think that as much as I have great respect for the free range parent movement and try to emulate them in some ways in the way that I'm bringing up my own children, I do worry that there's a kind of projection going on there among parents who are, you know, middle class parents who see all these stories about, you know, uh, CPS picking up someone's kid to, for, you know, walking to the park by themselves, which was a mile away in a lovely, safe suburban neighborhood. Um, you know, those are the cases that make headlines. 
they are outrageous. I completely agree. Kids should be able to walk to the park by themselves, but they're not representative of what child welfare workers are doing on a regular basis. They're, for the most part, super reluctant to take kids away from their parents because it causes a lot more work for them, um, you know, among other reasons. And I think they really do understand how traumatizing it is to remove a child from their home. So the idea that we're going to sort of, you know, just suggest that these um, these caseworkers are just making these decisions in a kind of flip way and, you know, and, you know, and to, you know, to try to make your life as a parent difficult or just because we live in some kind of like, you know, surveillance state or something like, because we live in some kind of like, you know, surveillance state or something like, because we live in some kind of like privilege that, you know, middle-class parents can imagine that this is, these children are really the ones who are the subject of most child welfare investigations. And they're clearly not. Right, right. The other um, point about celebrities um, is um, I love the group uh, Brave Love, which mm. focuces on um, adoptive uh, 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 birth mothers, um, because you know I, we we make birth mothers too look like this is a shameful thing. And obviously, sometimes when we're talking about the foster care system, we're talking about um, children had to be taken away from a parent. But there's also, there are the women who get pregnant unexpectedly and, and, um, and choose adoption, which is a beautiful thing to do if you are not able to raise a child. And we have to acknowledge more that that is a sacrifice that that woman has made. You know, it's not a light thing to say, I'm not going to raise this child who I've carried for nine months and gave birth to, you know? And, um, and so it's, probably a pretty extreme situation if she can't can't do that and she has to make this choice and um yeah i think we we need more cultural um uh, appreciation of that 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 yeah. this is this is um she chose life god bless her and that wasn't easy and she chose not to and she chose this i think especially in this racially charged environment it's it's you know I, whenever this comes up i would say my children's birth mothers, they chose this. They chose me. They knew who I was and they knew who my husband was. Now, obviously we're t it's different when it comes to foster care. Um, but when we do talk about birth mothers making that choice, it's like, it's a conscious decision. It's a choosing a middle-class life for their child. And um, especially during COVID, um, spending more time with my children and just thinking about, you know, it's really, it's not accepted to say in, um, adoption culture it's not an acceptable thing to say that your children are lucky you're like you're not supposed to say that like whenever anyone you're trained whenever anyone tells you your children are lucky you're supposed to say i'm lucky which is true but it's also true that they're lucky it is true you know? and um and i think you see that all the more during covid when you think about like the extreme situations that people are in and then there are children that are in homes where they're you know, they're loved and they're safe and um, no one, no random men are coming into the house and there's no drug use. And, um, and, I, and I can imagine that um, the m many birth mothers during this time can, can like should and can think to themselves, like I did this, like I did this for my children. I, um, and they're growing and they're safe and they're secure and, and I mean, I cannot imagine what that is like, but I, you know, I really admire that and respect that. So. And there's, there's not such a clear line, by the way, like these, these are not just two separate groups of people, like people right. who choose to, you know, right. um, you know, give their child for adoption versus, versus those people who have their children taken away. A lot of the time, frankly, if those women had chosen adoption, you know, those kids wouldn't be in the foster care system. And the fact that that's not a cultural message that's popular these days, I think, you know, it's not really popular on the right and it's not really popular on the left, frankly. Like, I just don't think we hear a lot about it. Um, the fact that it's not an obvious option for, uh, for mothers who are in difficult or dire situations, I think, you know, they, they then have the child and you, you will get a situation where that child is, is pulled out of the home and reunited and pulled out of the home again, and reunited. And this can go on, you know, for years and certainly for the 
those important developmental years, you know, children age zero to three, um, you know, where the secure attachment is not formed. And that then makes it difficult for them to achieve the, you know, social, intellectual, emotional development that they need to lead a well-adjusted life. So, you know, I, I, I do think that there are kids who are in foster care now, or who, you know, who would have been saved a lot of trauma, you know, if mothers had genuinely thought that um, giving a child for adoption was an option before them. And also this world of adoption has changed. Like our culture hasn't caught up with how much it's changed. Meaning like, a, I think it used to be thought of as, oh, you know, this famous story about agencies, there was one door for the par birth parents and one door for the adoptive parents. But today, I mean, the, the, there's most domestic adoption agencies have open adoption. So there are ways to actually have an open relationship in whatever way is appropriate for every family that would not mean that the, you know, what it used to mean. Um, so it doesn't have to be, it, it doesn't have to be, have like the um, shame um, that it, that it really used to, or, or those negative, completely negative associations that it used to have. I'm gonna go to, we have a couple of questions in the chat box in, in a second. I just wanna add to, to this um, about birth mothers. I've spent a lot of time around a Planned Parenthood recently just praying, which I kind of hate doing because you see stuff that you don't really wanna see. But what, what moves me so much and horrifies me is just how miserable women look going in and going out of there. And you, you figure, especially during COVID, we know that in many states, the abortion clinics remained open, even though people weren't able to get chemotherapy, you know? And so you mentioned choice, Malka. There are a lot of women who don't feel like they have a choice. And adoption is certainly not something that they really had the opportunity to think through. And I, I really am um, a big fan of states like Louisiana, where they, they have, you know, information for women before they they go in to, to get an abortion and and um you know i think one of the the greatest gifts we we could give women is is a real choice you know to to really fully appreciate that adoption is an option for them and and psychologically how you know it's it's a trauma you know you mentioned malka that the, the child is lucky, the parent is lucky. Yeah, but there's also this trauma of separation that we have to be real, realistic about. Um, but if we can be healthy about this culturally, like you're saying, Malka, there are so many changes. Um, but one of the other changes we have to make is we, we just need to be talking about this more, which is why I'm so grateful that every time I ask you, Naomi and Malka, you come on. <laughs> and we, we used to get, be able to do it in person. Um, hopefully someday we will again, but, but this will have to do uh, for the time being. And I think it's really, an encouragement that conservative policymakers are starting to take this a little more seriously than I, th I think we have in the past. It, it has, it's been a lower tier issue and it, it's not anymore increasingly, I think. Would you agree, Naomi? Uh, yeah, I, I just, I think that the, the, the line, on, you can look at, you know, public, uh, you know, surveys on the issue, but I think, you know, basically the line on the left is, you know, we just want people to have the choice of abortion. And I think the line on the right, frankly, has been a lot of, you know, you can do this, you can keep yeah, the baby, yeah. like, you know, it's okay that you're a single mother and you have no support. It's like, we'll help you, don't worry. Um, and so I just, I don't, I think that adoption has, has be become, you know, tainted in people's minds, you know, as Malka mentioned, like, you know, obviously there, there are lots of um, birth mothers who were not treated well in the past. And I think that became a problem. I also think some of the racial rhetoric has infected that debate too. You, you have this idea that, um, you know, having your child adopted by someone of another race is like a kind of, you're, you're like a traitor to your community. Right. Um, so I, I, I just think, yeah, we, we, we need to sort of bring it back into the conversation and, uh, you know, just make sure people know that they have that option as well. So one of the questions that we have is, um, my mother went to live with her great grandmother when her parents couldn't care for her. That was a good move for her, but I can see how it might not have been. Is there a middle ground where kids can make a needed move without red tape restrictions, but still somehow stay in the system and be monitored long-term? 
So I think there's no reason why we shouldn't have the same standards for relative foster care that we have for non-relative foster care. I think, you know, if, if you are in a situation where you, we think that it would be a good idea for your aunt or your grandmother or your grandfather to care for you, I think they should have to pass the same kind of, uh, you know, background checks that a non-relative caring for you would have. Um, and then, you know, the, the question of like, you know, following up and visiting, I, I just think we have to be aware of, uh, you know, of, of what the long-term outcomes are for these kids. I just, I don't love the, the informal kinship care in the sense that if we have determined that a child has, you know, been at, at, at in a large enough amount of danger that we want to remove them from their parents, that is a huge hurdle. The idea that, you know, we would just, you know, have them go live down the street with a relative who is going to give them total access to the person who put them in danger in the first place, I just think makes no sense. So I think we need to be, you know, enforcing the same kind of rules with relatives that we do with non-relatives. And another uh, wa watcher, a listener, um, another, another participant today is asking, Naomi, could you talk a little bit more about Care Portal? Um, sure. Uh, the, the way Care Portal works is that your religious institution signs up for it. Like your your church would have to, as I as I understand it, kind of sign up to be a part of Care Portal. And once that happens, then individuals within the community can sign up to kind of receive messages. So, like um, you know, if you had a situation where uh, you know a foster child was being placed with someone at the last minute, they needed baby clothes and a stroller and a car seat. Um, the, the child welfare worker could put a message up on Care Portal, you know, to people within a certain area, a geographical area, and, and that church and the people at that church would then receive that message and they could immediately say like, uh, you know, I have the stroller and somebody else might say I have the clothes, um, and then they can arrange it to get it to that person. Um, you know, I think it, it, it works not unlike, you know, any, you know, any of the, you know, next door posts that you might see on Facebook or something like that, but it's, it's serving this very specific purpose. Malka, how many years have you been focusing on adoption now? Three or, three well, I mean, my older child is three and a half. Okay. I, um, so sometime, I don't know, later in that year, yeah. introduced me to you. And so I got, you know, roped into all of this. Um, so I would guess three years. What, what are the things that when people come to you and say, what do you wish you knew, <laughs> um, Ben, that you know now, um, do, what are your answers to those kind of questions? I think the main thing is that you can get used to most things. Like this alternate reality can become like, your reality and you're going to know it and it's overwhelmed. I don't, I think not, don't allow um, the unknown or all those crazy terms that you hear and, and regulation, then you can't do this. You can't do that. Freak you out because you'll get used to them and you can, you'll learn how to navigate it. Um, Cause I think people dip their toe in, freak out and then they leave. And, and, and of course, there's the other side of it, like what can we do to ma actually make this easier and have people feel supported and all of that. But on the other side, there is, you can get used to a lot of things and there's a lot of things that can become normal for you or that you'll know how to navigate. Um, and for me, like, I, you know, I, I get calls all the time and I'm starting with people from zero, um, but I'm not there anymore. Naomi, what, um... What do you wish people would would know and pay more attention to? I, I I imagine there is a way for people actually to to answer this call in a in a new way. I mean, I guess there there are two things. One thing I was thinking just when you started the question about what I wish people knew. Um, I I wrote a piece a few weeks ago. Um, with John Walters, who is the former uh, drug czar. Um, and we were talking about some of the recent efforts to, um, and successful efforts to legalize uh, drug use in other parts of the country, in Oregon in particular, they basically legalized the use of everything. Um, and I think that people are just unaware of how much the drug crisis is really driving our child welfare crisis. It's yeah. 
I, I think we have, as a society, have sort of come to accept drugs as like, a, well, it's like a choice adults make and they sit around and smoke pot and they can still hold down a job and everything's fine. And I think that certainly characterizes, um, you know, some people and maybe a lot of people who use drugs. Um, but when it comes to the parents of young children, um, when you look at what's going on in the child welfare system, I mean, I think the best estimates are really that 80% of removals into foster care involve substance abuse, either alcohol abuse or drug abuse. And I think, you know, anyone who is the parent of a, you know, who has ever parented a young child, like intuitively understands why that's the case, why it's so hard to, you know, feed your addiction while at the same time minding a small child. Like, you know, someone, it's, it's funny, I go back to J.D. Vance because I think he's sort of an, an interesting example of what went on. I mean, at, you know, he was yeah. like, you know, 10 or 12 years old, um, you know, when his mother's addiction problems really became, you know, just overpowering. You know, a 10 or 12 year old can do a lot of things for themselves. They can make themselves dinner. They can tell other people if something's wrong. Um, you know, they can get themselves to school. There are a lot of things that they're capable of doing. If you have a child who's like, you know, an infant or a three-year-old, I mean, those are the children that we are constantly having to monitor to make sure that they don't get into anything dangerous. And the inability of a parent to be able to do that because of substance abuse um, is what is resulting in a lot of this neglect, not just, I mean, people always say, oh, it's, it, you know, the, a lot of what's driving child welfare is just neglect, it's not abuse. You know, neglect is when you have a two-year-old wandering around the house and you are not supervising them. They you are not supervising them to make sure they're not touching a hot stove or swallowing a bunch of Legos or wandering out the front door. Neglect is a serious thing. It's not a joke just because you're not, you know, whacking the child with a baseball bat. Like this is, I, I don't think people really understand what's driving child welfare. So that, that fundamentally is something that I just repeat over and over again in the hopes that someone will understand. Sometimes I wonder if people think that neglect is, you know, you're spending too much time on your phone or you watched Netflix last night, you right. know. Or you let your child walk to the park by themselves. Right, right, right. And Naomi, you always talk about also the converse about how like zero to three, those like any anything proactive like sets that child up for success long term yeah. um, in a way that, you know, it, later on, it's not the same. It's not as potent as those first years. Yeah, we, we just know so much about, you know, child's brain development now that we didn't know, you know, 20 or 30 years ago about just how much of that is being driven um, by what happens in those early years and how important it is for a child to have that kind of secure attachment where they, you know, have at least one adult that they can count on to meet their needs. And if that if that child just you know just finds instability and 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 reaches out you know for for physical needs or for emotional needs and that those are not being met, you know th it really does set the child up for just a lifetime of challenges. And we haven't even gotten to talk about it's not just the younger children but the older children who have a whole new another set of problems because they had the trauma at the beginning of life they've been in the foster care system for however long they have been and now they're about to age out and they'll get themselves arrested so they have somewhere to sleep and eat and shower you know um, and and that's something we can't let happen in America and yet we do. Yeah, the number of kids who, I mean, there were just another report out of Washington State about, you know, foster kids sleeping in hotels and homeless shelters. And I mean, this goes back to what I was saying about the need to recruit foster families, you know, who, you, you have to find people who are willing to take in like a, you know, a 15 year old and sure. And because otherwise the alternatives are, you know, and we're also shutting down group homes. Like we're just, we are closing off the options for where these kids can be. And then we're like, you know, shaking our heads saying we just need to abolish foster care. Like, where do you think they're gonna go? Like, that's the question I just sort of keep coming back to. And the other thing is anyone who spends any time in New York City right now, you know, I see so many young people who are homeless and, you know, because, because many of them look like they're high, I don't have a conversation anymore. Um, but I, I can only imagine how many of that, them are coming out of um, in unstable backgrounds, whether, whether it's foster care or, or not. Um, and, and then it just continues, yeah. meaning, and then you get pregnant and then right. all starts all over again. Right, right. 
Well, goodness, an hour is already up. And um, I um, I have to thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Malka. The, the statue behind me is Dorothy Day, um, another New Yorker who, uh, who uh, tried to do her best and, and actually had an abortion and regretted it. And, and it really haunted her. I, I'm struck by one of the last pieces she wrote in her 70s was um, made uh, we talked about the abortion that she still regretted, even though she had gone to confession and done all these things, um, all these wonderful things, um, but for for people who nobody else cared about, you know. Um, so anyway, I thought she 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 should be in our company with with um, New Yorkers who are, are making a difference and who really have you know a heart for people um, as you do policy work. And um, and uh, it, a couple of years ago, uh, Pope Benedict. Well, it was more than a couple of years ago because it was Pope Benedict um, gave me this message that talked about how um, how we need women to, to who are impregnated by the gospel to keep mankind from falling. And I, I think of the two of you as, as, as women impregnated with scripture, you know? Um, and um, so I, I love how we can come together as, as Old Testament and New Testament uh, types and, um, and, um, and work together to, to try to get more attention to to the most vulnerable children who really need um, need some attention and need some help, and so thank you both for the work that you're doing, and um, and happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Sorry, happy Hanukkah. Happy, happy Hanukkah. Hanukkah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for for listening. And I I guarantee you that Malka, Gruden, and Naomi Riley and I will get together again. So keep keep your eyes on the National Review Institute and and um, and to the work that they're both doing.